but on our focus this well, time yeah, no, is no, on on the seventies. As luck would yeah, have yeah. it, with these two aboard and and the third Doctor. So yeah, John Pertwee, he was cast as a third Doctor in the the summer of nineteen sixty nine. Uh, just as his predecessor's final story was reaching its slow, gradual end. Obviously, I think it was like week seven of the War Games, something like that. And the uh, the newspapers of the day, they feasted on the news of the series' reinvention uh, and that the central character would be uh, re-manifest again in the form of this enigmatic actor. He was familiar from the stage, from cinema, but most notably radio. John Pertwee was an incredibly versatile voice talent and sort of a household name after playing that the role of uh, the chief petty officer, wasn't he, on the, on the Navy Lark. He'd been doing that for well over 10 years at that point. And as I say, the idea that somebody could be a household name off the back of radio, I think that, that's quite an alien idea now. Even DJs, people sort of forget who they are. But Pertwee would, would remain on the, on the Navy Lark until long after he'd finished on Doctor Who as, as well. But in, in taking up the, the TARDIS key, if you like, the 50-year-old actor found a great challenge in effectively stepping out from under the funny accents and the false moustaches to play the hero in a family fantasy adventure serial that had its own place, Simon, in not just the TV schedules, but as almost part of the average British family, wasn't it? It was, but I mean, what we've got to remember is that by the end, towards the end of the Patrick Troughton years, it was dwindling. Uh, popularity was dwindling. Uh, viewing figures were, were dipping. Um, and it was at that point really at an all time low, which is kind of odd when we think about it, because we all love Patrick Troughton. We love the Patrick Troughton years. And I don't think that's that they didn't resonate with the public. I think it's just that it had been on television at that point for, for sort of five, six years. Um, that was a long time for a series in those days. And so I think it was just it was just slightly dwindling popularity. Um, and of course, what's odd then when, when John Pertwee comes up on board is that, as you say, Dan, he was known purely for comedy. I think I'm right in saying probably at, at, at that point he wasn't known for any so. straight I think this was his first straight what, role. Really, I could, yeah. So he I was couldn't. only known for comedy. And so imagine how sort of blindsiding it was for the audience to tune into season seven and uh, expecting John Pertwee to be John Pertwee. And, uh, 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 and, and you get this very, very, apart from some of the spear, uh, uh, spear from space, which is a bit more comedic. But only slightly. But the rest of the season is poor, really hard hitting straight down the line, and that must have been quite shocking for the for the audience of the day to expect one thing from Pertwee and get something entirely different. Um, and of course, they I didn't do... know whether he would make it work or not. They were ready to to ditch the show after series so uh, at season seven. Yeah, it's safe to say that Doctor Who's fortunes had been had been better, Steve. And the, the show was only really making it through to colour. And yeah. to the 1970s at all, because the BBC simply couldn't think of anything else to replace it with, could they? And Pertwee himself, he had his own doubts, didn't he? But he, he remained quite pragmatic and quite professional about it. And I don't know if he knew that he'd been gifted something as such in the way that people would now, but he was open-minded to the challenge, it would seem, and maybe charmed a little too by, by the belief that Barry Letts had in him and mm. Derek Sherwin, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, it didn't um, Barry Letts start looking for another another show, didn't it, about an Australian sort of yeah. um, uh, Crocodile Dundee sort of uh, yes. a, a, a prequel, not prequel, but sort of foreshadowing that sort of story, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. called Snow, it's snowy black or something i think he was i mean i mean barry let's yeah was sort of um he he was told by the bbc to find a replacement for doctor who so yeah. barry let's and terence dick sent sent spent most of the time making season seven also readying another series for if uh, doctor who was shelved yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. remarkable yeah. when you think about it but they were tasked with finding a replacement for doctor so, who while they were making doctor who so while Pertwee's making Ambassadors of Death, Inferno, etc., he must have been aware that yeah. this was this was probably a short-lived gig yeah. at the time. And when you think um, about it, Stephen, that was pretty brave of him thus to take on the role because yeah, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't have done his career much good if Doctor Who had finished with him in the no. role after just no. one year. So it's no, a no, brave no. decision, really, of his to take yeah. it on, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and an extraordinary decision 
to um it would seem and a number of people i know who are slightly older than me um were very dubious about john pertwee as a, as a choice of doctor mm -hmm. because they because he was known almost exclusively well exclusively for comedy yeah and then the, the great surprise the astonishing surprise that he's probably the straightest of them all actually isn't yeah. it i mean after, yeah. after, as you say after after there's a little bit of of comedy in um which which he deplored himself he said he couldn't yes. look at those things, like the, the he hated the scene in the duc de d'orleans shower. shower as he as he refers to it and and the um and um the trying on of clothes he the hates trying that. on it yeah he hates that as well yeah Mm. um but after and yet that it, and yet it's quite it's it's quite vaudeville isn't it it's, i think i'd file that yeah. file that under hijinks yeah but well, you really, really never see it again no, no. i mean that they, they don't stand out as being particularly they, they don't no. jar do they no. the, eight, the, eight, the only the only things that he he refines or gets rid of i think in the early films is, is the gurning you know the gurning faces yes. that he does when he's being strangled by yeah. The nesting the nesting octopus and there's a little bit in the side doctor in the silurians and yeah. i think because unlike tom baker who claimed he never used to watch it uh and left left it all to 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 intuition first we always watched himself and he probably saw himself doing that and thinking no that doesn't work and and mm -hmm. and uh, and excise that from the performance but i think um and i'm slightly biased because i suppose he is my doctor is certainly my first doctor um i don't think he ever puts a foot wrong very soon after that there's there's, there's almost never never a moment when he's when he's when he isn't absolutely on point i got know. the money no, absolutely. The money, yeah yeah and, yeah, and, and yeah. you're right steve and in, in what you said earlier in that he had a brilliant uh, ability to convey the fear that we were supposed to feel ourselves I, yeah there are certain doctors that, that different doctors have 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 different sort of specialities one of pertwee's was that the, that ability like the moment we, we were talking about earlier with with the with the um with the sea double coming through the door and it's an astonishing level mm -hmm. of 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 not fear but a communication that what i am looking at is the most terrifying thing in the Correct. universe you know. Correct, and and it's it's just sheer focus, isn't it? It's yeah. it's like a laser yeah. beam. It's one hundred percent focused on that yeah. moment, yeah, yeah. and it keeps you in it. And 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 in a way that somebody like Tom Baker, to me, doesn't. Much as I love Tom Baker, he doesn't have that same ability because he has more of somehow a detachment mm. from it. Um, mm. He's more somber faced. Tom yes. Tom is, um, and so he stays in the moment in a very serious, somber way, whereas. Pertwee absolutely transmits that fear it's that used the, to engage me right. as a child. That's right. It's the alarm. Pertwee yes. can do alarm. What what Baker does brilliantly, and I, I've I've just been rewatching Genesis of the Daleks for another discussion. Uh, I think Baker more than anybody else can do agony, cliffhanger agony. Yes. The episode three when he's being electrocuted on uh, uh, underneath <laughs> the thal. Yeah. underneath the thal rocket or yeah. when he's being strangled by the dalek embryo which was a which was a made up on the spur of the moment cliffhanger because yeah. maloney they, they it wasn't working was it It was going to be with the wires that's right said, i tell you what just grab one of these put it around here. and and it's it's superb and he sells the fact that he's just holding these pieces of plastic around his neck and you believe that that extraordinary agony you know, but I think, um, but I think, I think the other thing with Pertwee is he just brought that gravitas as, as you know, gravitas is just essential to the role of the Doctor. It's peculiar life. when it comes to John Pertwee, though, Simon, because here is somebody who had he'd been in entertainment by the time he took up Doctor, who'd been doing it for like 20, 20 years. I mean, thirty if you count his time before he he uh, went into the into the Royal Navy. So he'd always been sort of entertaining, and he came from a kind of a kind of theatrical background, didn't he? I know his family situation yeah. was quite complicated, mm. wasn't it? But he had an extraordinary life. And and even up until a few years ago, we were still finding out new things about John Pertwee, that he worked in the kind of in the Secret Service and all these other things. An extraordinary life, one long lived. And he I always get the impression, as you as you've just described, that charisma, that he just had that naturally, 
some people have it and some don't. I think actually everybody who's who's played the Doctor on screen has had that. Well, nearly everybody. But uh-huh. everybody, yeah. So everybody has had that. But I think that there, and you think, well, is there is there a typical person that can that is that would be almost destined to play the Doctor? And you look at the backdrops of Tom compared to John compared to, and they're all so wildly different. John Pertwee's back background couldn't be any more different than than, than Tom's or or Peter's. It was an extraordinary life, and so and to become a household name off Radio Two. At where people couldn't see him, and yet to look like this is you know, a really good-looking man, and obviously with a with a, a very emotive face, natural charisma. It's almost as if it's almost as if the part was waiting for him, and yet it, it had been on for seven years. And you cannot you can almost forget that when you watch Spearhead from Space. Mm. But but I mean also it, you we've got to remember that it was very very brave decision of Derek Sherwin to cast him because of the fact that he was so well known for for, for comedy. Um, it, it was you, you wonder what Derek Sherwin was thinking. Was Derek Sherwin expecting Doctor Who to suddenly move into comedy territory? Well, of course Patrick Troughton had brought elements of comedy, but it certainly wasn't comical. Um, and, and so. I just think Derek Sherwin made a, a huge leap there by casting Pertwee. And I suppose that Sherwin, when he was working on it with Troughton, he was kind of innovating and trying different things. Troughton, even though Troughton was about to leave, I don't think Troughton ever stopped trying to innovate with the part either. Mm-hmm. And they and Letts and Pertwee probably benefited from that when it came to this quite drastic at the time reinvention of the show with a kind of Quatermassy kind of kind of vibe. So that the Doctor's exile to Earth. He's in the employ of, of UNIT for the most part, helping helping fight off uh, alien threats and thwarting the mad scientists, all that kind of thing. So it proved exactly right for the times, Simon. You know, earlier on we talked about the, the power cuts and things like that, but there were lots of things making it through to the press around that time, whether about about new uh, new scientific uh, discoveries and evolution uh, and and all manner of things in sort of similar way that there are now. But um, so that was the what the series itself had one eye on. Whereas Pertwee himself, he kind of, he brought the version of himself that he'd never been allowed to be on screen or on on the air, or on the airwaves, he, and he could bring the Bond as well because he was clearly a big fan of of the Bond films and books. So he brought that, and yet he managed to remain and to make the Third Doctor more importantly to make the Third Doctor still for him still to be avuncular and to sometimes be petulant and, and childish too, and alien as well uh, but he's next to unflappable isn't he in that uh, inverness cape and the the fruity shirts he's next to unflappable in the face of danger and you only get the odd flicker on his face and and when you see when you see a tremor in pertwee's face then you know that the s is really going to hit the fan mm-hmm. and it's <laughs> you know different actors are going to respond to it in different ways but that's something that i've only quite recently seen in his performance it's taken me several years to get on the level with this, with this yeah, incarnation you, of the character. Yeah, you don't, you, what's your first memory of Pertwee? Because I think I, I, you're sort of, you're of the Baker generation, aren't you? I am. The yeah, Tom so Baker generation, yeah. My yeah. earliest memory of John Pertwee is watching Carnival of Monsters during the Five, five Faces, Faces of Doctor, of Doctor Who. Who. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, because that was extraordinary for us, those of us who, who grew up with Pertwee, because, because yeah. uh, we hadn't seen him since... Planets of the Spiders, because yeah. of the way that that it was impossible to, because there were no video machines, and because See, stuff I, I I I wrote my I wrote my first letter to the BBC requesting repeats in 1976, wow. and I got I, a really? letter and I got a letter back from Sheila Mullins brackets <laughs> Miss, <laughs> and she said thank you, dear Stephen, thank you for your letter and clever drawing. Because <laughs> I'd drawn a lot of Doctor Who characters <laughs> in this. Um, she said, unfortunately, now this this must have been about, it would have been just after season 13 finished. Mm-hmm. So she said, unfortunately, for various reasons, um, we will not be able to repeat any of these stories, um, largely because um, they are in the process of being wiped, of being oh. destroyed to make to make room in the archives. And also because of contractual agreements with Actors' Equity, we are not able to show stories, any, any episodes of anything more than three years old. 
However, she said, there will be a repeat of the Seeds of Doom this summer. <laughs> there wasn't. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> she lied. But the, but the point the point of that letter, of course, was the yeah. first, the dawning of the realisation yeah. of what was actually happening to, to mm. all this stuff. Not mm. only did I write to Sheila Mullins-Smith, the BBC, I also wrote to um, a certain television programme that people don't talk so much about these days. Um, which, I can imagine which one we're talking yes, about. Yes, 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 yes. I, I could, I'd rattle my jewellery if I had some. You would and, indeed. And, and, oh, and, I see. And, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, requesting, this would have made great television, wouldn't it? Me, me watching loads of old Doctor Who episodes as a fix it, <laughs> you know. But I wrote, and, I, and I listed them all because, because, of course, where is it? Various, various, I've got the Radio Time special here somewhere. Um, which was, of course, the. Did you have the Radio Time special, Simon? Do, do you know? Uh, I didn't have. I didn't have the, the poetry one. I didn't have the tenth Radio Time special. Ah. In the 20th because because I wasn't. I, I wasn't even aware in those days. Well, I remember watching the Three Doctors very yeah. very clearly again vividly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when it came to uh, to the repeat of that, um, that was revisiting a, a show that I could remember. Couldn't remember kind of monsters at all, but I could certainly remember the the Three Doctors. Very well, that's. Clearly. That's very interesting because because you know I, I'll often say, you know, because of the um, recent work I've been doing, that I, I remember the three doctors. Well, I do remember the three doctors, but I don't remember the old man on the screen. Or well, I remember an old <laughs> man on it, but I didn't know who he was. What I my memories of the three doctors, my most vivid memory of the three doctors, is the gel coming out of Doctor Tyler's machine and zapping him accompanied by some partic particularly sort of potent Dudley Simpson music and going into the sink and being very wary of our kitchen and bathroom sink after this experience. But that's at this time until Carnival of Monsters is the first story I remember almost every episode vividly of. And episode two was the first episode I ever saw in colour round at my grandmother's because we had a black and white telly until episode four of End of the Cybermen. So I remember very well from, from, from Carnival of Monsters onwards. But, but this is, so I've got it here. This is the, the, uh, the row, which a lad called Jonathan O'Brien brought his, his copy into, uh, into school during yeah. this season. So I associate round about the time of, of um, Death to the Daleks with, with seeing this for the first time. And seeing for, and, and becoming aware that this program had a history for the first time in season 11 because when the trailers would hit on friday and the and the link person would say tomorrow evening the doctor and joe face a new threat it was the doctor and joe and as far as i was concerned it had always been the doctor and joe and it would always be the doctor and joe that was <laughs> i didn't know about the other doctors and then this introduced me to that and i didn't have a copy of this and i sent off another thing i sent off for um a copy of that i think i got it round about the beginning of season 12 the beginning of tom baker to have a i copy suppose at that point though Stephen, the only things that had been commercially available in print were very much about now weren't they so if an annual came out yeah. it would be about the current doctor yeah and yeah, yeah things like that yeah, that yeah, was the first right. publication to as you say say oh here's a here's a history here's a yeah, almost yeah. like a, a document of something to, to speak of legacy we yeah, now yeah, call yeah. it legacy even though it was 10, 10 years it doesn't seem like a great great deal of time well, well even best. even the trailer for the three doctors if you look at it it says tomorrow evening the doctor and joe face a new threat the gels doesn't mention the three doctors at all <laughs> you know that's the bloody anniversary story <laughs> more more so, innocent more innocent times weren't they and they, they did use they used this opportunity and this actor i don't know how hungry he was but i think the deeper that he got into the part the more confident comfortable he appeared to be i think he got deeper into the into the psychology almost of the doctor who i know that some people have said the doctor's quite a two-dimensional character who always largely responds in the same way I, I don't think that pertwee saw it like that and i liked that balance that, that he can sometimes be incredibly seemingly arrogant and, and not appear to care and and yet to be so paternal towards his companions in particular and so exasperated with the brigadier one minute and yet value his friendship and trust trust his judgment implicitly 
the next. I think it's a fascinating take on the character that was probably a little too subtle for me when when I first saw him. I found the third Doctor the hardest to get to know. That, that was despite the repeats. So I saw Carnival of Monsters and then the Curse of Peladon and then the Five Doctors, which I've had in my life sort of forever. You'd have, forever, of course, really. you'd, you'd have been, because I think you said in our first chat that your your first memory was the Reboss operation. Is that right? Or, or one of your, or you, the first one you remember very vividly uh, as a child. It's one of the first ones, yeah, yeah. yeah. But all my memories sort of come from come from Tom. Yeah, I don't remember watching Pertwee. In fact, I'm but, certain that I didn't. So you must have been used to a, a more comedic take on the role, I suppose. Yeah, and, and yeah. perhaps saw that as being, you know, what what it was about. So and Pertwee, of course, early Baker is much straighter. Of course, is is is, yeah. is well, my my favourite Tom Baker. Um, but yeah, the, the, it must be quite a culture shock if you're if you're yeah, used I couldn't, to something that's I got a lot see of the comedy in it. Yeah, I couldn't okay. see the doctor in Pertwee's yeah. choices, in yeah. his aura, in in his physicality. I couldn't see him I, I, the way that other people could. Uh, the no. karate chopping, the the dandiness, the gadgets, working for the military. I I, thought, I wouldn't say I ever thought, oh, this isn't Doctor Who, but I certainly couldn't get a grasp of it. Well, it took, it took yeah, quite yeah. a long time. So and maybe it's something that you need to see in context having because because we were kids at the time um, and, and we were watching it for what it was. And of course, at the time we were watching it for the monsters. Um, that's that's mm. what you, you loved about Doctor Who at that age. Um, and so maybe it's a case that we almost fell in love with the third Doctor incidentally because we were watching for the Daleks and, and the Sea Devils and all that kind of stuff. It's, Whereas yeah. you, Dan, were coming from a more sort of slightly more um, analytical approach because you were that bit older. Um, I'd latched on to that central character. That's that's what it was. The I, I'd latched one. on really, really hard. Well, particularly, particularly to Peter Davison. So okay, when I yeah. started to discover the the era uh, in piecemeal fashion, obviously it was, it was sort of dripping through to me. But he was still at odds with what Peter had done and what Tom had done. Uh, not, I think the, the just, Colin's choices were kind of lining up in some ways, not in others. So that uh, it, 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 I mean, it, it is difficult because in a way, when you look at John Pertwee's performance, there are elements in it. Of, of, for example, the sixth Doctor, that abrasiveness, as you just said, when he was very argumentative and, and, and um, irritated by the, the Brigadier, for example, there's all that. Well, certainly in the early years, it, it obviously mellowed as the time went on. But in the early years, there was a, a great deal of friction between the Doctor and the, and the Brig in particular. Um, and so there is an abrasive quality that, that, that actually comes to the fore with the Sixth Doctor. And so I can say, I've never really thought about it before, but I can see what you're saying, that sometimes those, those kind of abrasive choices can make it harder to relate to the character but it's somehow it didn't maybe i was just too young at that point you know what i think part of it was as well simon the fact that that john pertwee to me was wurzel gummidge and john pertwee was also john pertwee because the man yeah. was a familiar face yeah. on british television on things like blankety blank and chat shows and things like that so i kind of knew him already he wasn't the mysterious alien steve and he was kind of he was kind of a celebrity with a small c and he used to go on these shows and he'd talk about his time on doctor who i think part of me i didn't realize it was the same show and i've got an example here to to play for you now of pertwee doing his razzle dazzle maybe you should say something like that john why do we all love creepy crawlies and monsters oh it's it's fantasy, isn't it? It's what the Jews, what the children said. They revel in it, all the blood and the guts and the gore. They are bloodthirsty, lot. Of course they? they are. Yes, yeah. they love it. I mean, all children used to watch monsters, then they watched Doctor Who. They used to hide under the table or behind a chair. But you try to put them outside the door, they'd object very strongly. We just love being frightened, don't we? We carry, we carry this on into adulthood, I suppose. Of course, yes. Um, of course, you, you were, you were in, involved with the odd, uh, the odd nasty and horror yourself, <laughs> were you not, in, 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 your, in your persona as Doctor Who? I've often wondered when you're making those things, I mean, uh, television studios are so false in a sense, but were you ever, ever frightened yourself by anything that, that happened to you in making that series? No, not really. It's very hard to be frightened by cardboard and tin, um, and that with a chap inside it that you just had lunch with. 
But, um... <laughs> well, I'm afraid we're not going to frighten you tonight because we, we, we have something of a surprise for you and we thought you were going to fall off the back of your chair and all that. Um, we've got, actually got a Dalek. Is it you, sir, the chap you just sort of had lunch with? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there he is. It's Fred's Fred, yes. Three kings to that hill, but not John That is... That is the voice of John Scott Martin. I'd recognize it anywhere. Am I right? <laughs> John Dalek. Uh, you, you are is right. <laughs> We weren't exactly alarmed. Thank you very much indeed, John. You weren't exactly frightened. You see, I've always found those terrifying. <laughs> I, I refuse to be frightened of something that's made of tennis balls, cardboard, and sink pumps. Um, <laughs> which, which Nick Briggs has never forgiven him for saying. And, uh, and, uh, cause it, and of course, um, you know, he, he, he did despise the Daleks. Yeah. What, was, what was most heartbreaking for me was not discovering that he wasn't frightening the Daleks, I didn't have any respect for them. But, and tapping in very much to, to, to Dan's explanation as to why it was perhaps difficult to uh, acclimatize himself to the Persway Doctor, um, was the morning after the broadcast of one of the repeats of Carnival of Monsters, going to the bus stop and some kids slightly younger than me talking about telly the night before and one of them went ah did you see wurzel gummidge trying to be doctor who last night i went i thought oh my god of course they all think he's wurzel gummidge yeah and you i wanted to go no 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 he's not worth he's doctor who he, da! <laughs> and there it is and of course it's interesting that, 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 that has well, been that has been an entry point for some people who liked yeah. Wurzel Gummidge and then found that, that they became fond of yeah, his does, doctor yeah. because they liked Wurzel Gummidge. But, In the same but, way. but it's, it alienated others like Dan, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But of course, as far as I was concerned, it, you know, sure. Doctor Who was John Pert because I didn't know any other. And there were almost never any interviews with him. I think there was the yeah. one where he went on with the Who Mobile on Blue Peter. And I think he appeared with the Who Mobile on Billy Smart Circus or something. But until the series Who Done It, he wasn't regularly known uh, for, to our generation for being anything but Doctor Who. So, so the the illusion wasn't spoiled. And of course, the thing to remember, is, the, the thing to remember is that following on from that is that at that time in the in the mid seventies, he was absolutely huge as Doctor Who. As Doctor Who, you know that I do remember. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. very he was very prevalent. Um, yeah. You're, you're right. You, you, you just, you were just aware that this man was Doctor Who. And again, I'm the same as you. I didn't know that. I remember my parents sort of dimly saying that there'd been other Doctors before mm. John Pertwee, and I kept grilling them and saying, "Well, who were they? What were they?" And they hadn't got a clue. I and so, yeah. it was John yeah. Pertwee to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's he safe to Doctor. say that Pertwee's career was never the same again. It's yeah. as, as you say. So people got used to seeing him as him maybe and maybe he became more comfortable with it i don't know i mean i i interviewed alex from the who shop last year and she was talking she talked very generously about her personal relationship with john and how he suffered terribly with stage fright and yet you would never think it when you see when you see him walk onto the stage on, on just on wogan and stuff like that with his with his chest pumped right the way up and, and speaking in such a commanding way he appears unflappable then so the idea that pertwee could could suffer with stage fright i've always found that I found that fascinating since well, since Alex told me about it. It's compensation, isn't it? A lot of performers are like that, you know. That the, there's and Katie Manning, I think, in the interview she does one of the on one of the Blu-rays talks about how his vulnerability, his sensitivity, how he was easily hurt, you know, how he was easily offended, um, and there's this this huge kind of theatrical front, which a lot of you know a, a lot of actors masking, veiling, masquerading that their, their sort of uh, their their fragile you know that that the, their sort of timidity underneath it all um well, the, but what what was just just to what one more thing about about P pertwee in the immediate aftermath of doctor who, i think it was it well it was it was the the first series of of it was between seasons 11 and 12 was a series called who done it but the persona he had in who done it was very like the doc when he presented it in fact, he'd often say, he'd say, welcome to another series of Who Done It, or if you prefer it, Doctor Who Done It, he'd say. 
And, the, and, the, and he, it was like he, as the doctor, was presenting it, the persona I, there. I, and was, you're was, right. And I remember as a kid just being absolutely thrilled by him. Absolutely. Dennis, because yeah. you, I, as a kid, I did feel like Doctor Who was presenting yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it yeah. was, as you say, Stephen, a very similar persona. Yeah, um, and it, it was just really thrilling to see this man who I adored at that point on another program and yeah. I didn't quite understand why at that age why that there's a separation between the action and the character so yeah he was Doctor Who present and the fact that it was called Who Done It I know perfect it, yeah. It, yeah. They, they tapped into that obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah. of course yeah, yeah. they knew what they were doing yeah, yeah. That's well right, yeah. for yeah. all that the the uh, involvement with Doctor Who the Doctor certainly revolutionised John Pertwee's career I think and sent him off in a, a different trajectory to one that he could ever have predicted one that would last for the rest of his days he, he became instantly identifiable with with both the doctor and Wurzel Gummidge and he would remain so at the third doctor himself undoubtedly initiated a rebirth of interest in the series